Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors that may be at work in the Hart family murder case. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. I'll start with the background of the two people that are thought to be criminally responsible for the deaths in this case, and then I'll move to the mental health and personality factors. So the two people are Jennifer and Sarah Hart. They were both born in 1979. Jennifer was born in South Dakota. Sarah was born in Minnesota. They went to Northern State University. They each transferred out to different schools. Jennifer would not earn a degree, but Sarah did. Both of them had studied elementary education. They entered into a romantic relationship while they were at college. In 2004, they moved to Minnesota. They both worked in retail. They adopted a 15-year-old girl, but one day they dropped her off at a therapist and they never returned. So I guess that was their way of saying that wasn't working out for them. Sarah had her last name changed to match Jennifer's in 2005, so they both had the name Hart. They married in 2009 in Connecticut. Jennifer and Sarah would adopt six children. Marcus, Hannah, and Abigail were adopted from Colorado County, Texas in 2006, and Sierra, Devante, and Jeremiah would be adopted in 2008. Devante would later be in the news. He was photographed embracing a police officer as he cried during a protest in Oregon following the shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. This photograph became exceedingly popular. Now, throughout the time the family was together, there were several accusations about maltreatment of the children. There were allegations in 2008 when the family was in Minnesota after a teacher discovered that Hannah had bruises on her arm. Hannah told that teacher that Jennifer had hit her with a belt. Two years later, Abigail said that Jennifer hit her and held her head under cold water. The couple had discovered a penny in Abigail's pocket. She said that she found it. They didn't believe her. They accused her of lying, and then, of course, they were violent. Interviews with the other children revealed that they all claimed they had been denied food periodically and had been struck. Even though Jennifer was implicated, Sarah would plead guilty to misdemeanor domestic assault and attempt to inflict bodily harm on another. She was sentenced to a year of community service and probation. In 2011, Hannah reported to a school nurse that she had not eaten all day, Jennifer angrily shoved a banana and nuts in her mouth, and Sarah said that Hannah was playing the food card. Not long after, all six children were pulled out of school and homeschooled. The Hart family moved to Oregon. The state was informed about what happened in Minnesota, and they opened an investigation, which included interviews of every member of the family, as well as people who knew the family. The investigation indicated that the children were not allowed to laugh, and they had to raise their hands before they were allowed to talk. The children were described as trained robots and little soldiers who were frightened of Jennifer. Jennifer and Sarah denied any wrongdoing, and no definitive conclusion was reached. In 2017, the family moved to Washington State. In August, Hannah jumped out of her window and ran to a neighbor's at 1.30 a.m. She asked to be hidden. She told them that she had been beaten with belts, her mothers were racist, and she begged for them not to return her home. After Jennifer and Sarah had retrieved Hannah, they tried to explain what had happened. They said Hannah was lying, Hannah's biological mother suffered from bipolar disorder, Hannah and the other children were drug babies. The same neighbors were frequently visited by Devante. He would ask them for food and ask them not to mention that to Jennifer. He also said that he and the other children were sometimes harmed, not given food, and hidden from other people. The authorities were notified. They attempted to contact the couple on March 23, March 26, and March 27 of 2018. On March 23, Jennifer, Sarah, and the six children climbed into their GMC Yukon and drove off. On March 26, near Westport, California, Jennifer drove that vehicle off of a 100-foot cliff with everybody inside of it. Everybody in the vehicle was killed. All of the bodies were recovered except the body of Devante. Later, a judge ruled that he was in the vehicle and a death certificate was issued. Technically, the cause of the collision was not known, 
but it was ruled a murder-suicide by a coroner's jury. Jennifer was intoxicated, her alcohol level was over the legal limit, Sarah and the three children had antihistamine in their systems, specifically diphenhydramine. A few days before the collision, Sarah had searched the internet about Benadryl and drowning. Jennifer and Sarah were both 38 years old. The children ranged in ages from 12 to 19. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. Jennifer had been described by others as eccentric, domineering, abrasive, funny, confident. She had a history of theft. She was considered narcissistic. She posted on social media frequently, like these images of a perfect life. She wanted to convince everybody else that Jennifer and Sarah were living a dream. Some people believe that Jennifer could have been delusional and that she wanted to be a hero. As far as her personality, we see perhaps mid-range openness to experience. There's not a lot of information about that trait. We see low conscientiousness, high extroversion, low agreeableness, and high neuroticism. Looking at Sarah, she was described as constantly working. She had a good work ethic. She was unwilling to challenge Jennifer. She was an enabler. She was gullible, cold, and callous. So again, with openness to experience, it's hard to know, maybe mid-range. We see mid-range conscientiousness and extroversion, high agreeableness, and mid-range neuroticism. In one of the reports, the couple was described as looking normal. So now moving to the theory of the crime. Why would somebody do this? Let's take a look at the stressors that were involved in the lives of Jennifer and Sarah. I'm not aware of any reports about mental illness of any type for Jennifer or Sarah. As I mentioned, some people believe that Jennifer had delusions, but I haven't seen the evidence to support this. It does seem reasonable to believe that Jennifer and Sarah could have been depressed based on what they did. And of course, there may have been some substance use based on the fact that Jennifer was intoxicated at the time of the murders. They really seem to be barely holding on in terms of managing their daily lives. For example, they were getting behind financially. They were $16,000 in debt. Sarah was the only one working when they were in Washington State. She earned $45,000 a year. The couple also received $2,000 a month in adoption assistance, and two of the children received Social Security benefits. The couple was getting in trouble with the authorities again over how they were treating the children. We see a history of violence. Sarah had those misdemeanor convictions. They were having trouble getting their actual experiences to match the image they were trying to project. Jennifer and Sarah said several times that they were targets of discrimination. That's how they explained what was happening to them. And they may very well have been, but it seems like they were using that to explain events that normally would not be attributed to discrimination. For example, did discrimination by the community force them to be violent, to fail to feed their children, to avoid the authorities when they came knocking at the door, to force Hannah to run over to the neighbor's house? Jennifer claimed that they had been receiving death threats, but I'm not aware of any evidence that supports that claim. Some people have argued that Jennifer and Sarah were really trying to promote the idea that they were heroes. I talked about that before. They adopted the six children. They're trying to save them from harm, give them a better life. They would go to all these places, these events, take pictures of the children, interacting with other people, posting that on social media. They received thousands of likes on Facebook. There are people who believe that the famous photo with Devante was staged. He was crying before he approached that police officer. So some have suggested that Jennifer forced him into that situation to create that famous picture. Putting the stressors together with their desire for the perfect image could lead to a motive for this crime. The couple knew the authorities wanted to talk to them about the reports from their neighbors. The couple's image was going to come crashing down. They were going to be caught. If the authorities had talked to the children, they would have discovered the serious offenses that were occurring, and that could have resulted in more criminal charges. Perhaps their level of narcissism was so high that this was unacceptable. They would rather face total destruction of the entire family than the humiliation of being exposed as violent offenders and frauds. The murders were premeditated. There is a lot of evidence that points to this. We see that Jennifer had alcohol in her system, and of course, Sarah and three of the children had the diphenhydramine, as I talked about. Sarah had taken 42 doses of that drug, 
So this was a toxic level. Now, only three of the children could be tested, but it does seem reasonable to believe that all of them had been given this antihistamine. That was probably the way the couple was planning on controlling the children as they moved to the cliff and drove over the cliff. There were also those searches on the internet I talked about, and nobody in the vehicle was wearing seatbelts. So yes, this crime was premeditated, but I don't think it was premeditated from the moment they left their home. I think this idea came to them a little bit later on. They posted a payment to one of their accounts right before the murders, and they purchased food right before the murders. I imagine they left the house trying to evade the authorities, and then they came up with this plan later on, like they were disorganized and desperate. They didn't know what to do. According to a witness near that cliff, they were parked there for four hours. According to their vehicle's computer, the SUV stopped 70 feet from the cliff, accelerated, and there was no application of the brake. Jennifer was driving. She was impaired by alcohol, but it still would have been very frightening to drive off a cliff. So she stopped and summoned enough of what she thought was courage. Obviously, eight people died in the collision. Jennifer and Sarah conspired to commit six homicides and bring an end to their own lives. If bringing an end to their own lives would have solved their shattered image problem, why did they commit the homicides? Well, this could have been attached to the narcissism. Jennifer and Sarah may have believed deeply in this idea that they were victims, that society was the cause of all of their problems. So from their point of view, they committed these homicides for altruistic reasons. They believed they were protecting the children. I think this is like the us against the world mentality. We are in this together. So we're going to succeed together or fail together. Another reason could have been rage. They could have blamed the children for what had happened to everybody. And finally, it could have been revenge. Society was not pleased with them because of the way they were treating the children. So they were going to get revenge on society, teach society a lesson for having been critical of them. Looking at the research literature, we see that female family annihilators are exceedingly rare. From the few cases that have been studied, we see several tendencies here. They tend to kill when they're afraid of losing custody. They tend to be depressed. They believe they're protecting the children. And they are calculated, efficient, and controlled in the planning of the crime. These crimes rarely involve a protracted physical battle. This case is often cited as an example of the system failing. I think the system did fail here, but also these murderers went to great lengths to avoid being caught. They moved twice, they kept the children inside, they kept them isolated, and they made excuses when other people found out what was going on. Even though they were disorganized, they were efficient at evading detection. This horrible crime was likely the culmination of years of maladaptive behavior. It's quite difficult to see what really goes on in a house. One of the friends who reported the couple said that true kindness, love, and respect for the kids was largely absent. Her statement taps into a serious issue, but not one that the authorities can easily convert into something actionable, because some constructs are exceedingly difficult to measure from brief interactions. And really, the concepts of kindness, love, and respect are abstract. I think what really needed to happen with chronic offenders like Jennifer and Sarah Hart would be regular visits over the course of years, not just coming to investigate complaints and then leaving. So it's more like a relationship. The authorities, the investigators can get to know them. They can realize when something is out of place and when it's not. One of the problems in this case, from the point of view of investigators, was they didn't know what had happened before. They didn't know what was unusual. They couldn't tell when something was out of place. So they kind of defaulted to, we can't prove anything, so we're going to let this go. That turned out to be an unfortunate decision, but I can understand the restrictions they were under. They could not accuse people without sufficient evidence. So again, without that relationship, without visits happening frequently, they just couldn't be effective. So this is a terrible case that gives us a lot to think about in terms of the current systems. So those are my thoughts on the Hart family murder case. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.